Here we are, lazy days again on Wingnuts Art of Longboarding. Ipon mi yokatta ne. Ipon ne. Onto mo. Are hondo yokatta shi, naiyo mi yokatta shi. Sono kake de sugoi ano boku tachi mo yokatta shi sa. Kode amma yokatta kara ni hon me tsukuro to motte. Tsukuro to natchatta ne. Um, kore wa chotto yokatta kedo ne, sugoi tain na ni hon me de shi ya ne. Mazu. まあね、あのー、じゃあ何のハウツーにしようかみたいな話になっちゃってじゃあサーフトリップのハウツーはどうだ<笑>無理やり,無理やり<笑>これはね、うん、ウィングナットがコスタリカに行きたかったんだよ、ね、そうそれだけなんだよねそうそれで行こうよっつって,言って、うん、それでなんか無理やりストーリー作って今,回今度は吉川雄二君を、えっとれね、連れてコスタリカに。旅することになりましたそこでねロバート・オーガスもいたりマーク・マーチンソンもいたりね、うん、もう本当素晴らしいサーファーと一緒に僕たちもサーフィンできたからでもすごかったのはあいつらがさ俺たち船で撮影に行くじゃない彼らが船から降りたら他にいるサーファーがみんな上がって帰っちゃったもんねそうだよね,ね、うん、<笑>もうすごいライディングなウィングナットと、うん、あのマーク・マーチンソンそうあとケビン・ミスクも行って,って、ね、でコーディ・クレイグっていうあ当時まだ 10,、ね、10代で今もう結婚してね、うんあのー、サウスカロライナーかなんかに住んですごいいまだにすごいサーファーとして,てお父さんも来てたよねそうそうトム・クレイグだ、うん、そうそうそう親父さん彼はあのサン・オノフレのいわゆるクレイグファミリーっていうのはサン・オノフレのローカルの中でものすごく、うんね、あの歴史のあるあのー、ね、うん、そう一家で、まあ、そんな人たちがみんな来てくれてさ、うん、俺あいつらの,そのトム・クレイグに言われたこと一番嬉しかったのはジョージダメが大きくなるほど上手くなるなって言われた<笑>いや俺は何も答えないけど<笑><笑>、うん、いや本当そう、うん、でもそうだったね,ねすごくい,いろんなやっぱりマーク・マーチンソンがやっぱり僕は一番ショックだったかなだって見た目こんな太っててさでもうまいよねいやもういきなりどんなサーフィンやんだろうなと思ったらうもう弾丸のようにかっ飛ぶそうも,ものすごいちょっと彼だけど始まるのにはあのビールのケースがないと始まらない人だったよねそうそうそうビールを持ってビーチに行ってねそうこうやってね入れ物にちゃんと赤と白の入れ物に入れてそれ絶対ビーチに置いて上がったらその上座ってビール飲んでたよねそうだね<笑>まあ、うん、あのコスタリカ素晴らしい波と、うんまあ、素晴らしいロケーションだったんで、まあ、これもすごく楽しいそれであのビデオにはなったんですけど、ね、いろいろさ面白いことがあってさあなんか釣りの撮影入れようなんて言って、うん、釣りに行ったじゃん行ったよ、ね、そしたらさその日だけね俺たちウィンナットと柴田光之のカメラマンとマーティンソンとだから波探しに行ったんだよそしたらちっちゃいワンを見つけてパーフェクトなグーフィーの波が入っててオフショアでもうグラッシーで,でずっとウィンナットっているとあいつレギュラーの波しか行かないからここは唯一のグーフィーの行ったんだよねそ,その時にグーフィーの伊沢は来なかったんだよねそれであれだよね面白いそれも伊沢がそれを聞いて写真見てはい、じゃあ行こうよって、次の行ったらもう風吹いちゃダメだったよね。で,でも、<笑>それでもまあ、いい波だったよね、うん。で、それもこの作品の中に。入ってる、ね。あの、デボーションっていう曲と一緒に。ね。あの、グーフィーフッター二人が。ちょっと頑張ってますけどね。そこの波も、俺たちは四輪駆動で岩の上走って行ったのに。うん、今はあれも、道ができて、混んでるポイントになっちゃったんだよね,ですね,ですね。当時はもう誰もいなくて、道もなかったから。ね、すごかったね。まあ、とにかく。そういういわゆる秘境もいろいろ巡ってね、うん、すごく楽しいホテルにプールがあってさ、うん、みんな帰ってきたらそのまま海パンそのままでプールに飛び込んでシューッと潜って泳いで向こう側にはバーカウンターがあってプールの中座ってマーガリータやピーニャコラールみんな飲んでたよねもうあれは最高だったねで帰りね生産したら、うん、ジョージがさ、うん、あれねこういう感じだったと思うんだよねだからプロダクションフィー制作費のやっぱり国内での例えばポストプロダクションだとか、うん、そういう部分は全部あの日本の僕の会社で持つそうそうそうで制作海外の,そのロケのフィーは常時のアメリカの会社で持つっていう形で折半しててそれで宿泊の最後の日に常時が支払いに行ったら。なんかねもうすぐ支払えるはずなのにね10分でも20分経っても帰ってこないんだよ<笑>何やってんだよってこう言ったらね
あの、ね、プリンターが昔のプリンターでビーベーベーってこれ畳むやつあったじゃんこんなん畳んでてこんなんなってんのまだ終わんないんだよみんな酒代もうねみんなねもうそこでビール買ってたりだってホテルタダだったのに、ねね、40万50万そっち超えたんだから60万ぐらいいったんだよ<笑>ホテルタダで、ね、食事を外で食べて酒代でそれ行ってんだよあれ10人ぐらいでホテル全部タダだねそうあのそねだからまあそのホテルの紹介なんかも本編の中に入ってます、うん、でも本当そのあれをねあれを写真撮っとけばよかったなあのじじじじと降りてきてるそうそうそう本当ね、もうコースタリカって素晴らしい場所で波はでっかくない西海岸はでっかくないんだよねだけどいいポイントがたくさんあるんだよよかったねこう行かないとじゃあ皆さん check this one out YouTube Art of Longboarding 2 The Traveler Traveling is what every surfer looks forward to, whether it's a simple trip down the coast to surf a new break, or getting in a plane and going halfway around the world to surf somewhere entirely new. It's what surfers really love doing. It's primarily Bruce Brown's fault. You know, in 1964, he made the endless summer, and he planted the traveling bug in every surfer's, you know, heart. And that's what we've done. You know, we've chosen one of my favorite locations, a place I love to surf, Costa Rica. Gathered up a really good group of friends, and we're going to go surf some warm water, have a really good time. You never need a definite excuse to go on a surf trip. The surf can be crummy at home or you're just plain tired of surfing the same spot. Whatever the reason, we've been watching Endless Summer 2. We got to talking about Costa Rica and warm water, which everyone in Northern California talks about. And we decided to find out if Mark was going to be going down to Costa Rica again. Mark and Robert go down there a lot. Turns out Cody's dad, Tom, was going to hook up with Mark and go down there. This is where we can come around the corner and come to the project. Should we just do it? Should we just go? Yeah. It's a done okay. deal? Let's go. Yeah, let's yeah. yeah. go.
Yuji. How's it going? Ready to go to Costa Rica? Cody, Cody called his friend Yuji. The next thing you know, we're Tamarindo Sounds bound. Good. All right, see you later. All right. Bingo. All right, we're set. Let's go. It's important when you go on a trip to know, you know, do some research about where you're going. Are you going to a really hot climate, a cold climate? Because it changes what you bring with you. It's going to be really hot, like Costa Rica. You pack all the hot weather gear that's specific for that. Rash guards, sunscreen, everything that you're going to need to stay cool during your trip. It's going to sound corny, but whenever I go on a surf trip, I always make sure I bring my own beach towel because no matter what happens, you're gonna be careful with the towel you steal from the hotel, but it's gonna get filthy, and eventually when you return it and you wanna check out, they're gonna charge you $25 for a towel that should cost three bucks. Good soft racks. Whether you buy a soft rack system from one of the surf manufacturers or just buy the big cargo straps that you can tie boards to a car, they're essential because you can't count on your rental car having a good rack system. I'd never travel without a really good first aid kit. Almost by bringing it along, you guarantee that you don't need it. But you don't know how remote you're going to be. You can be two, three hours away from good medical care. So you've got a kit, you can clean out a wound, you can stop the bleeding until you can get to somebody who can help you more. So it's a really good idea to carry a top-notch first aid kit with you. It's gonna happen on the trip. Somewhere along the line, you're gonna get a ding in your board. So it's a good idea to bring, you know, the quick, new, solar-activated ding repair kits. It'll get you back in the water within minutes. Backup equipment. It sounds kind of corny, but bring a second leash if you can. Make sure you have plenty of wax. If you can afford to bring two of everything, you know, a second pair of sunglasses, a second pair of sandals, stuff just disappears. Somebody's taking care of you. Hey, here's a pair of sandals. Here's my extra wax when I leave. So pack a little bit more rather than less, and you can be the hero when you leave. After years of traveling around the world, I finally come up with a system to protect the nose and rails of your board. It's almost foolproof. Prevent any ding while you're traveling. The rail protection system is really simple to apply. You take the rail protector, you take your board, good roll of tape, split it open, and start bending it around the rails of your board. With the tape, and away you go. Bring your own beach towel, wrap it around the tail block, you're bulletproof. If it's practical when you're going on a trip to take two boards, by all means do. Bring an average board, you know, a board that's good to ride almost all conditions, and for that I brought the Mark Martinson Step Deck. It's a wider outline board. It's a really good nose rider. It'll work in surf from one foot to six to eight foot, actually. I mean, this is a great all around board. This is my little yellow W2. I like it because it's the fastest surfboard I own. I've ridden it in eight to 10 foot surf, even a little bit bigger. This is when the surf gets real good, I've got my hot dog board. The next thing you can bring on a trip to add variety to your equipment is a different set of fins. I bring a big 10 inch fin for when the surface smaller, I wanna do nose riding, I wanna mess around with my Martinson, I use a 10 inch fin. I use my nine inch fin on my yellow board on the W2. It's looser, faster, good for bigger surf. Okay, this is the basic question. Why did you choose to bring this board along on the trip? Well, I knew the surf in Costa Rica wouldn't be super, super huge, but I knew it could go from small to maybe we get some good overhead waves. Um, this is my standard nine foot tri-fin. I can set it up as a single fin, but I like riding it as a tri-fin. Um, I can ride knee-high waves, or I can ride, you know, maybe if we get some hollow overhead stuff, this will still work for me. All right, I got two pretty much identical boards. This one I had shaped first, um, shaped by Mark Martinson. It's a step deck, nose rider, 
Um, it's pretty wide in the um, up towards the nose, but the tail is brought in a little more, so it get better for turning. Um, I, I like it because it's just a great nose rider, a great all-round board. And you, you basically brought its twin sister. Pretty much. I, I liked it so much that I, I got another one. Same, same, uh, same length, pretty much same dimensions. This one's just a little thicker. It's easier for paddling. Um, I, I like this one. It's a better nose rider. I came to Costa Rica for the first time when we did Endless Summer 2. And everything we did down here worked. The surf was fantastic, the people are real friendly, and the little town of Tamarindo just seemed like a great place to use as a, as a central focus point to come down and have a good surf trip. and I've been back every year since. When you get to your destination airport, You've got certain things to figure out, you know, where the rental car agencies are, all these, you know, things that are complicated because you're a surfer. You've got surfboards and, you know, awkward luggage. Usually, as a surfer, you're not on a package tour. There's not going to be somebody meeting you at the airport, you know, putting you on a bus and taking you to a resort. You're going to be renting a car, figuring out a map, and driving for a few hours until you find the little place that you've rented to go surf. So rental car situations are different in every country, but for the most part, you have to be at least 25 to rent a car. When you arrive, if you've made a booking for a rental car, there'll be somebody from the rental agency there to meet you when you get off the plane and you've come through with your bags. They'll throw you in a van, they'll take you over to their agency, and they'll have the car waiting for you. It really is a user-friendly country to come to with a surfboard.
Salvador and Costa Rica, Reese. Two men on a mission, two men in a jeep. Well, they traveled all day and they traveled all night. They had plenty of pesos and black beans and rice. Mark and Tom are expecting us in Tamarindo. They put the hammer down and they was out of sight. Old Mexico, they was jamming the gears, never stopping for nothing. Said maybe for beer. You head out of San Jose down the winding mountain road, and about three hours later, four hours later, you'll hit a town of Liberia. It's the only street light you're going to see on the Pan Am Highway in Costa Rica. When you get to that red light, turn left. Follow that road, it leads to Tamarindo. Tamarindo 400. It takes between four and five hours to drive from San Jose down to Tamarindo. So we just dive in at the river and take a surf. You just, you gotta wash the road grime off, you gotta get happy. About 10 minutes up the road is Playa Grande, and that's a neat, really neat beach break. There's an outside reef that's not really any good for surfing, but because the waves come in and hit that reef, it, they really diffract off the reef and create all these nice wedges, and that's really made some nice sandbars at the beach break at Playa Grande. It's only 10 minutes up the road. Beach breaks, for me, it's almost the most fun kind of a surf spot because it's a beach, it's a nice sandy spot. You can ride without a leash, you can take a lot of chances because nothing's going to happen to your board. You, you know, this is where you really want to approach a wave and see how late you can make it, see how deep you can get, see what kind of wave you can take that hitting you in the side of the head and still make it. You'll do a lot of swimming at a beach break, but it's also because it's a fun place to challenge yourself. That's why I like them. You had a Cody, on the other hand, he's a little bit younger. He's got a more aggressive approach to a wave. You'll see Cody do anything with this surfboard, frontside or backside, loves getting in late, loves throwing the board up on the lip. Real progressive young approach to surfing. The way I approach a beach break is the same way as I do at home. It's just the peaks are always switching around, so you gotta, you gotta just keep your eyes open, be ready for the next wave, and just make your, bot or your bottom turn clean and the rest of the wave will set up for you. Hopefully they won't close out. When you're looking for a tube at the beach, what do, what do you look for? Uh, usually I'll try to look for one on every wave, but I mean, it's not always there, as you can tell. Um, a lot of times I'll stick my arm in the wave. Maybe, like, if I see something down the line, I'll just look for just down the line to see if there's something like pushing over and then try to pull in.
Kevin Meska is one of my best friends from Santa Cruz, and he's the powerful goofy foot. He, you know, again, it's a solid power style of surfing, but a more modern power. I mean, he's up and off the lip, big cranking cutbacks, and he loves the real round power that you get out of a beach break. I found the beach breaks a little, uh, a little more challenging, a little uh, unpredictable. The peaks, uh, you're sometimes in the right spot, sometimes in the wrong spot. Uh, I was just trying to surf them without falling. And we also got to bring Yuji along this time. So we've got a surfer from Japan who's done a lot of travel and he's surfed a lot of different waves. And he brings his own style. Again, it's a more younger, progressive style. Once you roll into Tamarindo, you, you've got to figure out where you want to stay. We figured it out early that we were going to stay at Vista Villas. It's got a great view, the people that work there are really friendly, and they can help organize the other things that you're going to do on your surf trip. If you like surfing Playa Negra, if that's your favorite wave when you come down here, there's two great places to stay down there. There's Las Olas, which is right there on the beach, real nice swimming pool, great view of the spot. And just tucked behind it is Pablo Picasso's. And that's our favorite place to go get some food after a big surf. Pablo is one of the most gregarious guys in the world. Tells a better story and hits a golf ball farther than anyone I've ever met. And one of the traditions in Costa Rica, when you're looking for a place to stay, they're so surfer friendly that if you've got a surfboard in your possession, it's 10% off on a room. You'll never find that anywhere else in the world. You guys again? Gosh, you know?
Mr. Martinson, how are you? Good, hey. Where's Sasquatch's dad? Hey, you guys made it. Hey, all right. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. Come on out and check it out. Yeah, it's really unreal, you guys. This is great. This is where these guys look for girls, which will tell you why they don't get any, because there aren't any out here on the view, but it's, you know. John, there's that left point break. It's a pretty good deal. You've got Fly Grande, the island. Yeah, a lot of little boys hang out over there. There's an unreal spot down there. Cody Craig has been a good kid. I've known him for a lot of years, but it started a long time before that. I knew his dad, Tom, and his uncle, Don, and their father, Doug. I mean, it's pretty rare to have three generations of surfers in a family. Cody's grandfather, Doug, has been surfing since the 1930s and 40s. Tom Craig, a solid, traditional, goofy footer. His brother Don is a regular foot. Tom's the goofy foot. Rode for the Bing surf team and still has that smooth, graceful style. Lots of really tight little steps. Real big feet. You can look at his foot, it almost spans rail to rail on his board. Tom has a very clean, old-school approach to the wave. He finds that high trim line where he's not gonna cut back or be climbing and dropping. He'll find a trim line, set the board on that, and then start working forward. And he finds that fast spot on his, on his board. But he can make the whole way, 100 yards, with, his, with his both feet right on the front third of the board. Real fast style, and also a very clean style of riding the wave. Mark and I have been friends for a long time now, and in the simplest sense of things, he's my shaper. He makes my surfboards. Without him, I wouldn't be able to do what I love most in the world, go out and have a good time in the surf. When he was in the early McGilvery Freeman films, you, know, you watch Mark in those movies, and you see the same Mark you see now as far as the style. You just see it, it's grown a little bit. The wave knowledge has gotten a little bit better. He's one of my favorite surfers in the whole world. I just like the way he approaches a wave. It's a real power-oriented surfing, real simple, real smooth, and he'll apply that same technique whether he's riding a beach break, a reef, or whatever. It's always a power-based, trim, speed deal. The way I've developed my style of surfing all comes from 
Mr. Martinson. The Pan Am Highway down to Liberia and chop a left and that gets us out to Tamarindo. So that's pretty much where we're at here in Tamarindo. Really good. One of the great joys of traveling is, of course, trying to find a new surf spot. And this is uh, Monte Paulo. And when you come to a place like Costa Rica, where you know they've been surfing here for 10 or 15 years, but not a really long time, and there's a lot of coastline here, there's a good chance at finding you know a spot no one has ever surfed before. You can still do that, and we succeeded in doing that on this trip. Unfortunately, it was a left, <laughs> which was really funny for Mark and I that to go through all this labor. We've been down here so many times, and we finally discovered a new spot, and it's a left. But needless to say, Kevin and Tom, about as happy as they could be, it was like Christmas for them. We found a really neat left hand point reef break. There's a rocky point, some underwater reefs out there, so the wave did all sorts of neat things. You know, nice, easy, mellow takeoff, and then it would hit a couple of shallow spots on the reef as it worked its way down the point. I mean, it was heaven for those guys. You'd see super long nose rides, little hollow sections where you can do head dips and little cover-ups, big cutback sections for Kevin and Tom. They were having a great time. They were having a great time. Mark and I were ready to commit suicide. Reef breaks are neat because it's a consistent break. The wave is breaking over a solid object, a reef. You either have the coral reefs that you'll find in Hawaii or other South Pacific regions, and here it's a rock reef. 
Um, again, a, a, it's a hard, solid surface. So the wave's real consistent. They'll always come in, they always jack up in the same spot, always have the same hollow spot. So you know what the wave is going to do. So it allows you to take more and more chances. We've got Playa Negra here, a real solid right-hand reef break. It's about 30 minutes south of town. And when a good swell comes in there, it's one of the best waves in the whole area. Playa Negra is a real consistent reef. There is a separate rock outside of it on the low tide with a big swell. You'll see that boil up. You can actually take off on it. It's a good place to use as your takeoff zone. You know, we got there at high tide one day and it just dropped out till it was breaking on that outside boil. You take off on that boil, you set up the racetrack, you're running, and you know at the end of that wave, there's that shallow spot. And you're trying to come at it with all your speed, and it's just gonna heave over at the very end. So that's where you're trying to punch through, have your speed to make that at the end. And that's where, that's the tube spot. Tom and Kevin trying to stay ahead of it. It's a little more challenging backside. You want to get hit in the back of the neck. Cody and I all trying to go through it from a little bit behind. And the number one rule, don't stand up real tall. You get hit in the side of the head real fast and go upside down. Happened, happened to everybody that day. Because of the long travel time down here, we like to usually come down for two weeks. Well, I feel great. 
and invariably in that two week period, you're gonna get a down day, one or two, where the surf goes flat, or the winds go crummy on you. And that's a good time to go play golf, go on a fishing trip. Tamarindo has all that. Trouble comes around once in a while Hurts my face to wear if I take more than trouble to get me down You come here singing the blues Tell your buddy what you can do Look in the mirror and grab hold of your ass You got what you need, you found it at last Whenever we come down and we know the swell is good, we make plans to go to Ollie's. Trees are black along the road I'm staring out from my window the clouds And you want to get to Ollie's early. It's a dawn patrol deal. You get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, make sure your car's loaded the night before, so when you get up at 4, you just throw your backpack in and you drive. I dream about the war ahead But I can barely understand And you get there and you get on the boat, it's still barely light, sun's just coming up. and either Ollie's or Witch's Rock. It takes planning the day before. You have to hire a boat, you have somebody at the hotel call over, make sure a boat is reserved for you at Playa del Coco. And it takes an hour to get to Coco from here and then another hour on the boat to get out to Ollie's. And you want to get to Ollie's early. Just how deep those pennies fell come around the headland, you get the first glimpse of the back of a wave at all is breaking. I mean, just the excitement level just goes way up.
Ollie's Point was nicknamed after Oliver North. Apparently he was running uh, a base in there that they were supplying the Contra rebels in Nicaragua out of. So it was first discovered in the early 80s by surfers because the aerial photographs that they used to expose the base when the news media found out about it actually showed waves peeling down the point. The point, it's called a point break, it's called Ollie's Point, but it's actually a river mount. There's an estuary in the bay there in the cove, and it, the river lets out, the estuary lets out right at the top of the point. And so the river lets out at the top and just funnels sand down, and creating a sand point. Always is kind of unique because you're taking off on a wave that can be waist or shoulder high, but as it peels down the beach, it just grows. Just the energy just starts to pick up and build steam as it wraps around the point. Surf trips are about the adventure. You're not always going to be guaranteed good surf and offshore winds and perfect conditions. But if you bring a good group of friends along with you, you know, make sure you bring someone younger so that he has to load the car. If you can, go with somebody that's been there before because they can help you figure out where to go and where to stay and what the local conditions are like. But appreciate the adventure of the trip. You know, there's something about each trip that's going to make it special. Find something new. You know, learn something about each trip and everywhere you go. Surf travel, surf adventure, it's part of the life that you want to lead as a surfer. Make me smile, feel 
trouble comes around once in a while. Hurts my face to wear if I take more than trouble to get me down. You come in singing the blues. Tell your buddy what you can do. Look in the mirror, grab hold How far of away from civilization you're going to be when something happens. You're out on a boat somewhere like going up to Ollie's Point. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, hey! That was Mark Martinson's butt. Took a long time to go by. Everyone's watching the crack again. Let's not make fun of Yuji. Walking. Cut. Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. So close. So close. Whenever you get a bunch of surfers together, whether it's a pick four. <laughs> Hands up. Hands up. Hey. <laughs>